supposed to have about a theology. I think I spoke on it last year, and um, if people have heard me before, I sort of don't like to go totally repeat everything. So I want to spend a few minutes looking at apophatic theology, then get into um, St. Simeon the New Theologian, who's one of the big figures in this area of theology. And then I want to sort of end up looking at the context of the times when he was teaching. And um, look at how things sometimes sort of fit into the whole culture of the time. If you're looking for his book on this, um, Vladimir Lossky, The Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church, is a good starting point for this. Um, apophatic is sort of the unknowing. What we don't know. Oftentimes in negation, we talk about apophatic and cataphatic theology. Cataphatic theology is where we describe the nature of God, what he is like, what we know of him. Um, particularly when we start talking about Christ, who's he's been seen, he's been touched. Where there's a there are particular things we can say. Whenever we talk about things, we almost always end up talking by comparison. A billiard ball is like a basketball, but it's smaller, and it's hard, it doesn't bounce. We start with something and we then start doing comparisons of where <coughs> it's similar, where it's different. The problem comes if you have something that you have no comparison against. What do you do? Um, and this is what apophatic theology is, is this unknowing. The difficulty of apophatic theology is there's two aspects to it. One is a lot of this is coming out of Neoplatonic philosophy. That is the language that a lot of the um, apophatic <coughs> theology people are using. Because that's sort of the closest language that they can find to put with it. Um, Platonius, one of the Neoplatonists, talks about the one is radically simple does not even have self-knowledge, since self-knowledge <coughs> implied multiplicity. Our thought cannot grasp the one as long as any other image remains active in the soul. To this end, you must set free your soul from all outward things and turn wholly within yourself, with no more learning of what lies outside, and lay your mind bare of ideal forms as before the object of sense, and forget even yourself, and so come within sight of that one. The difficulty of this Neoplatonic thinking is it is this abstract concept of unity and oneness. Not so much the particulars. But yet that's the language we oftentimes find being used. Um, St. John of Damascus. God then is infinite and incomprehensible. And all that is comprehensible about him is his infinity and incomprehensibility. There are three theologians in the church. Pseudo-Dionysius, the Areopagite, Maximus the Confessor, well, actually it's four, Gregory Palamas, and Simeon the New Theologian. Simeon the New Theologian is one of only three theologians that we really have in the church. We have Gregory the Theologian, we have St. John the Divine, and Simeon the New Theologian, which gives us some idea of the importance of him and the importance of what he has to say. Gregory Palam, um, Simeon is born about 949 and lives till 1022. It's sort of a high point of some of the Byzantine church. Gregory Palamas comes along about a century later and really is the one who, in a sense, takes this thinking and applies it along the language that we are familiar with. He gets into the, the definitions of things like energy and essence that we use to try to deal with that which we can know of God, where we can relate to God, and that which we cannot come into contact with. Gregory Palamas makes the comment, 
the practice of inner prayer, aiming at union with God on a level beyond images, concepts, and language, a sense in which the term is found. In a sense, this is a term also found in Evagius, Pontica, and you'll find it in Maximus of Contrastum. Um, the problem of really getting into Epiphag theology, especially from like the meaning of new theologian, is it's experience, it's not language. Simeon is someone who, at the age of 20, has this experience of God. And at age 27, he goes off and becomes a monastic. And he is discipled under Simeon the Studiite. Studiite was a, one of the main monasteries in Constantinople. He's someone who has such an incredible experience of the unity, the oneness, the mystery of God, that when he writes about it, he does not use theological language. He uses poetry. Um, have a book of his writings, and everything he writes is in poetry. Because it is not, because language is not enough in concepts to describe what he's going to talk about. He's the first person to really start giving accounts of spiritual experiences. Um, the church has always not wanted people to talk about their spirituality out of pride. But Simeon felt it was necessary to talk about his experience in order to teach others. He says, as I was meditating, master, on these things, suddenly he appeared from above, much greater than the sun, and he shone brilliantly from the heavens down into my heart. Or what intoxication of light, or what movement of fire, or what swirling of the flame in me, miserable one that I am, coming from you and your glory. The glory, I know it, and I say it, is your Holy Spirit. And while I was there surrounded by darkness, you appeared as light, illuminating me completely from your total light, and I became light in the night. For Simeon, there's this idea that anyone can experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. And to him, it's a conscious experience. It's not a... It's not like sometimes when we partake of communion or the sacraments. We're there, we know theologically there's more going on, but we don't experience it and see anything else happen. Simeon is convinced that everyone can have this experience. He really sort of upset the church, too, in that he said that nobody should be made a bishop who has not had this experience. But he's also careful. He doesn't take it as far as Nathalia. They said that you had to have the experience of the Holy Spirit, and if you didn't, the Holy Spirit was not in you, and you were not saved. Simeon goes sort of right up to the edge. He's, he's pushing theology, and most of these apophatic theologians are pushing to the limit. But I think we have to say, say somewhat, his first experience is at the age of 20, even before he entered the monastery. <laughs> We see this oftentimes that those people who are of this mystical theology, they sort of grow up with it. It's not, um, there's elements of this early in their life that they may then later on in their life develop more completely. It's not something I think we all have, but I think we have to recognize that this is something that's in the church. He says further, do not say that it's impossible to receive the divine spirit. Do not say without him you cannot be saved. Do not say, therefore, that one can possess him without knowing it. Do not say that God is not able to be seen by men. Do not say that men do not see the divine light. For that's impossible in these present times. This is the thing that's never impossible, friends. On the contrary, it's very possible to those who desire it. But only to those who lead a life purified of passion and having purified spiritual eyes. There's also this tendency in looking at this unity, this oneness with God, of almost getting into pantheism. Pantheism is this idea of this complete unity. And Christianity, in the extreme of mysticism, goes right up to the edge of that. Um, you find in Corinthians, it talks about God being all and in all. As 
if everything is God. Um, Simeon uses the language. It has been the seas and also the abyss of abysses, which are united to the drop, since I possess one drop. I possess them all with it. And besides this drop, which I tell you I possess, is completely indivisible, unseizable, completely incomprehensible. You cannot limit it either, or though difficult to see, it is completely God. This is the sort of thinking they get into. But how close is this? Um, not necessarily a spiritual writer, but the music group Meatloaf. If you remember their song, of just a drop of water in an endless sea. They're taking it from a pantheistic perspective, that everything drops into the sea and is merged into this vast oneness. It's undifferentiated. It's the loss of the individual. But Simeon is not going to push it that far. And it's also that pantheism, pantheism has a problem <coughs> with duality. If God is everything, how can there be <coughs> any evil? Because it's all just God. This is again what these mystical theologians will push it, but not quite step over that edge. You also, to understand him, you have to understand the times in which he is living. Um, who's heard of Stephen the Nicomedian? You don't see his icon. Stephen of Nicodemia was probably the theologian of his time. He was the one that the patriarchs went to, the one who had the reputation of being the theologian. He was also in the Aristotelian speculative theology. And this is the tension that is going on between those who are speaking of experience and those who are speaking out of reason. Because theologians like Simeon are almost unreasonable. They have such a strong experience that they, they can't defend it with reason. They can't argue, they're not going to argue it. But they can get a little bit um, poetry can get a little edgy at times. The spirit who has been sent by the Son of Man, not to the unbelieving, nor to the friends of glory, nor to orators, nor philosophers, nor to those who have studied the work of the Greeks, nor to those who are ignorant of the interior meaning of our scriptures, nor to those who have held a role in the world stage, nor those who speak with the affection and with a great flow of words, nor to those who have achieved great names, nor to those who have successfully been in loved by renowned personages, nor are the accomplices of those who act illegally, nor those who give titles, nor those who receive them, nor to those who amuse themselves, nor to those with whom we amuse ourselves, but to those who are poor in spirit, in their way of living, to those who think simply, live more simply, and to those who thinking is simpler still, the former because they have the spirit for their teacher. Have no need of the knowledge which comes from men, but enlightened by the light of the Spirit, they look at the Son and see the Father and adore the Trinity as persons. <coughs> the time when Simeon is writing is by many looked at as being sort of the epitome of the Byzantine Empire, the high point of the church. A generation before Simeon, you've had... Um, just had a revival of monasticism. And one of the big theologians of the time has established a monasticism that's based upon absolute obedience to the elders. A lot of the, what we talk about of obedience to elders, obedience comes out of a time just before Simeon. And in a time when monasticism is in favor with the emperor, because they maintain order and unity with the civil administration and the masses of believers. And they have extensive property, the monasteries do. It's also, everybody's familiar with the Triodium, or know what that is. The 
Triosian is basically the book of services. Of all the, the services, the prayers, who does what, how they're all done. And this is also just before Simeon comes along. Um, by Theodore the Studiite in the ninth century. What has happened, though, is things have become institutionalized and rigid. The importance is not what you mean by the prayers, but how precisely you say the prayers and are doing them. It is not your inner spiritual state, it's your obedience to the abbot that becomes important. And in that sense, Simeon comes along, and he's a radical. Because he is advocating you follow the Holy Spirit. Now, it is not sort of enthusiastic type of spirituality we sometimes see today, where it's overthrow everything. Simeon, the new theologian, is in strong obedience to this other elder, a Simeon of um, a, a studio. He's somebody who is deeply in the prayer and the service. But to him, this is not something he's doing because it's a rule. He's doing because he needs this to be close. If anything, he's probably more disciplined than a lot of the others at that, at that point. But you think of a monastery where you have <coughs> a thousand monks. You can't just say, okay, go do your own thing. There's always this tension in the church. Um, you look at the Old Testament. On the one hand, you have the priesthood and the temple worship. It's the priest of the temple is going into corruption. That the prophets, as a charismatic element, are having to call back to proper worship and proper faith. It's what you see going on in the first in the first century at the time of Jesus, where the Pharisees and the Sadducees are concerned with following the law and the obedience. And Jesus, who is in a deeper understanding who is the law, is seen as the one overthrowing it. And in this case, Simeon ends up being criticized by the theologians of his day and finally actually exiled. We think of the church at this time as being at the epitome. And we call him Simeon the new theologian. The church at his time is not respecting him. <coughs> to me, we look at this, if you have that inclination towards this type of spirituality, it's wonderful. But I think we have to be careful that it's not for all of us. Some of us may struggle and never experience a prayer, uh, a mystical theology. But neither can we go rational and deny its existence. And we have to sort of realize that the church has always had these sort of extremes. Extremes of trying to refine theology and extremes of the mystical experience. And as long as both sides can affirm the other, there's room for all of us in here. It's also where I think we have to be careful to not idealize the church. Because all, because as Simeon is saying, the struggle is here for Christ. It's not to build an institution, though those are needed. He's a monastic. He's in a monastery. He, he sees the need for structure. But they're not the only thing. It's a humility that we don't get triumphalistic. And idealize the current period, the Byzantine period, and say this was the perfect Christianity. And if we could just go back and recapture that, then everything would be glorious. We see that it, it doesn't go that way. Um, slight diversion similar to this is Wednesday night we read the life of St. Mary of Egypt. 
absolutely incredible. But you see the same tension going on there, almost parallel to this, of um, Zosima is probably the most spiritual person of his time around there. He's gone off to this monastery because they don't know who he is, and the reputation is lost. And I think he's a little full of himself, because he's basically asking God, who has the spirituality that I have? You see this same answer in his mother, too. And this is when God has him goes off to the back. And it's a beautiful theology that gets brought out for Joseph and Mary. Because when they first meet, they fall down before each other. And then they get into a theological argument over who should get up first. Mary is arguing, you are the priest. You are the one who touches the body of Christ in the Eucharist. Therefore, being the priest, you should get up first. And Zosima is sort of like, forget it, lady. Your spirituality just blows everything I've conceived of. But you see this charismatic element of someone like Mary who has not been trained, who's not studied, who's not gone through the normal monastic discipline, who Zosima recognizes has a spirituality <coughs> that's really his. But the beauty of that, they are not sitting back saying, yeah, you're right, my spirituality is better than yours. Or, you're right, I'm the priest, you're not the priest. But it's a humility in Christ, of seeing the need for all parts of the body working together and coming together in the presence of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and that's what we need to be striving for. Questions? Good. That's a bad theology. <laughs> <laughs>